Today we're going to get into the unique uh, polymer yielding mechanisms that we're going to kind of discuss. Specifically, uh, we're going to talk about necking, necking, crazing, and shear banding. So again, yielding, once you've exceeded that yield stress, again, the sample permanently deformed, non-recoverable um, deformation, permanent deformation. Um, so kind of a similar nature, again, uh, to, you know, metallic materials. So movement and dislocations, again, uh, it's the same kind of concepts apply for single crystal polymer fibers. Um, but however, in amorphous and semi-crystal polymers, we observe crazing and shear bending that are unique and that are not observed in metals. So crazes are going to be basically this opening of the crack. So there's going to be some micro crack. In between those micro cracks, there's going to be these, let me show here, there's going to be these fibrils of polymers that span these little micro cracks. Again, they're going to be very, 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 very small uh, cracks as well. Um, so that's going to lead to this change in volume, and there's kind of this unique stretching that can occur there. Um, there's also shear bending uh, in those cracks. So if you have a, if I have a material here, the crazing, the cracks will kind of form, again, to your that plane that's essentially uh, where your where your shear stress is maximized. So this is at an uh, angle of zero. You'll also see this idea of shear banding um, that can occur in some uh, polymeric materials, which is where maximum shear stresses will occur. So I know that that angle is 45 degrees for, again, if I'm on, under this uniaxial tensile um, test state. So, but again, it's the maximum shear. So it occurs along where maximum shear is applied. So shear bands can also lead to formation of necking, and um, we're going to talk about necking actually right now. So let's talk about shear banding first. So uh, shear banding uh, can occur and actually kind of leads into this necking. Now necking you've probably seen before, um, you know, for metallic materials. So you're pulling on your dog bone sample, and oops, a horrible dog bone sample right here. So this is the initial thing, and then you'll start to see this neck starts to thin. Uh, thin out and it becomes very, 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 very thin. And necking will occur. And necking occurs when, again, you, in your stress strain curve, we look at stress strain, you have some strain hardening, and then, like, that is where, this is where your necking occurs when you hit that peak, that ultimate tensile um, stress. Um, now, for polymers, again, due to the, um, a lot of the, you know, many unique, uh, many unique properties of polymers, but Polymers will actually lead to very, very stable necks. Um, and it's because, again, the stiffness, well, they're able to kind of rearrange, but as you pull a polymer, uh, those polymer fibers will be aligned with that applied stress. And again, the stiffness of a line polymer is highly anisotropic. So there's gonna be a lot of strain hardening at high elongations. So as you pull your polymeric sample, so here's my polymer sample. As I pull here, again, that sample becomes to neck, but at that neck, your polymer fibers are now aligned, and they can even recrystallize. So they form a very, very stable neck. And again, that leads to, you know, if you're comparing the stress strain curve for a metal, which will hit this neck and then break, your polymer will go here, neck, and then it'll just stay, it'll go, 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 go. Uh, go it'll still it'll create a very, very, very stable neck. Um, again, uh, so it will kind of strain harden uh, quite a bit. Um, so necking is going to definitely occur uh, as a result of uh, kind of strain hardening. You could look at x-ray scattering patterns to observe, essentially, the key thing is this alignment of the chains. And that's how it's able to, again, it's going to be oriented along the direction of applied stresses, and then it's going to, again, high degree of strain hardening and stable neck. So that's one cool aspect of uh, polymer chains. So the neck is much more stable compared to metals. The other things are these shear bands, which are these zones of material alignment, uh, hundreds of, you know, thousands of nanometers wide, uh, and they're going to create at stresses G over 30, theoretical yield stress. Um, they're highly non-uniform, uh, but they will typically form, again, if you're in a uniaxial tension, 45 degrees relative to the applied stress. Because, again, they form where at the locations of maximum shear stress. So if you're, uh, you can actually look at an example, not that, right here. So here's a nice picture of, right here, you can see all these kind of, you know, oops, excuse me. Let me see if I can annotate here. Nope, it's not letting me. So you could see, hopefully on this, uh, in A and B, these kind of shear band regions. Again, they're kind of this cross, these 45 angles, because it's under uniaxial um, tension. So that is kind of one unique plastic deformation mechanism of polymers, this shear banding, where maximum shear stress occurs. 
You could also find crazing. Uh, and crazing will occur, again, highly localized deformation. Distinct, they're distinct from a crack, but they're very similar. And you'll see these polymer fibrils will span the crack. And they're going to form perpendicular to the loading axis. Again, they're not going to, um, crazing will also not occur under compressive uh, stresses. And so, again, it's where that material is going to basically crack. It's going to be your maximum principal normal stresses. So if I'm pulling here, it's going to crack. If my material is like this, it, was, it would be crack. It would crack like that. If my material was like this, I was pulling it like this, then it would crack again uh, like this. So perpendicular to your kind of loading, again, regions of maximum principal stre uh, stresses as well. Um, so they will not occur under compressive stress because, again, you can't form a crack like that. Um, so, uh, but again, you'll see the cool thing is, again, tension only, but you'll see these fibrils. Uh, they're much smaller, too. They're like 20 to 50 angstrom, um, and you'll see these fibrils start to span the crack. So actually, we'll look at it right here. So you can see much smaller length scales, but you can see these fibrils. I wish I could annotate on this. <laughs> actually, let me see if I could edit. Yes, let me enable my editing. So here you can see the, sorry, this angle, which is 45 degrees. Again, assuming that we're loading in this direction right here. This direction, this direction. Um, and here you can see those fibrils, right? So you can see very, very small 20 to 50 angstroms. And they span essentially that crack. And you can kind of see the same idea here. So those fibrils span the crack, they actually stabilize it again. Um, uh, and they'll, again, they're not the typical of, cra you know, cracks are like micro cracks. Um, so they'll span and connect the faces. So metals can't do this, again, because no long chains of microstructure, they can't form um, essentially these fibrils or these tendrils. Um, you'll see that usually 50% of the void is going to be filled with fibrils, you know, typically. <laughs> so you'll see kind of this light scattering effect. And actually, you could visually see crazes occur in your material. So again, we could see this um, when we would do our, um, our, you know, in-person lab, you can actually see the crazes form. Um, and there's some really cool kind of surface-free energy um, kind of idea. So if you remember back to your um, kind of fracture and fatigue, um, you know, it was this kind of combination of elastic strain energy and then, again, creating surfaces. So the fibrils kind of reduce that free energy of creating new surfaces. So it has some, you know, <laughs> um, basically it's going to be more favorable uh, but at some point, then again, again, you're stretching the fibrils. It'll be more favorable for the fibrils to break off um, to exist independently to, again, minimize that, you know, uh, that surface area or to minimize the elastic strain energy in that material. So very, very cool. Uh, uh, as usual, a very interesting uh, free energy problem. So <laughs> that's kind of the idea. Um, and actually, you can see maximum stretching is going to be the length between entanglements, um, just like we've kind of talked about previously. Uh, that it can be fixed. Uh, so you can entanglement uh, molecular weight divided by the molecular weight of the monomer. So be back all the way back. Everything's connected in this course. So when you're kind of re reach those permanent entanglements, that entanglement molecular weight uh, from your polymer melt. So you can kind of uh, figure out uh, from that, you can approximate the contour length uh, between those entanglements. So uh, those are the kind of the unique, again, so crazes will form perpendicular to your uh, loading direction, shear bends, again, maximum shear stresses, uh, maximum shear uh, stress states will form, again, if it's this uniaxial loading, 45 degrees, but again, they will form at your maximum shear stress state. So expect an example problem like that, or a problem like that on an exam. So next time we're going to get into asymmetry in the yield criterion, and then finally into just um, a quick little kind of fun lecture or fun, uh, fun uh, topic of how you deal with uh, dislocation or defect motion in polymeric materials. And then that's it. I'll see you all in the next video. Thanks.